for the week is in uh, Philippians chapter number 2. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for our Savior, and we thank you for your love. That you'd commend your love toward us in such a marvelous way that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That from the moment he stepped out of heaven's glory and took on himself our, the weakness of our flesh, made in the likeness of sinful flesh, lived the life in our flesh that we couldn't live, and yet went to the cross and took our sins and made sin for us that he might be capable of giving us his righteousness, that great exchange of Calvary. Then he's raised from the dead so that he can say it's done, it's finished, it's over, the debt's paid, the victory's won, and he could give us life in place of our death, righteousness in the place of our failure. We thank you for that. It humbles our heart to know that the creator of all things would value his creation, value, value even us to that extent. And we pray tonight as we look into your word that we do it with hearts that are filled with gratitude for the privilege of having your word, of knowing you through it, and being, being able to honor you by having it live in us. And we pray tonight that these things that we talk about might encourage our hearts to faithfulness, and to courage, in Christ's name, amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, he, Paul says, Do all things without murmuring and disputing. And Well, that's a verse you, you can talk to Christians about for a lot. But we're going to move on. They that, be, they, that, they may be, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Now, I think Ted said, either Ted or John, I forgot now who, Ask that question when they read that verse before is that what nation would that not be? You know, Paul lived in, 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 the, in, in the Roman world, uh, the Greco Roman world. The, Philippian, the uh, Philippians lived in, in, uh, in, in Philippi. Philippi was one of the uh, free states in, in the Roman Empire, it was a great, great city of, of ancient Rome. And, uh, but it was, it, this is what it is we live in the present evil age, the whole world lies in wickedness. So you can take this verse and put it into your own, own thinking without any real difficulty. Among a whom you shine as lights in the world. And that's who we really are. We're a light in the midst of darkness. I've said many times to, to our folks that, you know, Paul, there's a verse in Second Corinthians 6, Paul says, as unknown and yet well known. <laughs> and that's really the way we are. Who, who, in, who in church history is going to remember us? And yet we're here. And yet we're doing what God gave us to do. And there have been people just like us all through church history. That's how we got to be where we are. And somebody says, well, where are you in church history? Well, we're the same place we're going to show up. You know, the people that write history are the winners. And uh, we're, not on that, we're not the part of that crowd that, that writes church. Church history is written by Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants. That's the bottom line of it. And since we're none of that, we're, we're, we're kind of left out. That's Okay. Because we, we aren't looking to history to validate who we are. We're going to shine as lights. You, turn the, you, 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 you take a candle and light it and put it on that dais right there, and it won't light this room up very much. But you turn all the lights off in here, and you know what happens? That little candle becomes a beacon. And that's the way we are. We're, we're, we're shining as lights in a dark, wicked world, holding forth the word of life. Now, that's how you shine as lights. <laughs> 500 years ago, October 22nd, 1517 is the date that's given. Martin Luther uh, went and, and tacked his 95 theses on the door of the church, the Wittenberg uh, Castle Church in Germany. And that event sparked what was called the Protestant Reformation. Those 95 theses, if you read them, they're really a remonstrance against the issue of indulgences. And they were not really something that was, you know, you, you read it and you say, well, what was the big deal about this stuff? He's complaining about real uh, religious tyranny. But though that event led to what, uh, what became the Protestant Reformation. It started a Reformation, but a Reformation it wasn't because you cannot reform a vain religious system. You don't reform something that's apostate. 
You don't reform something that's vain. What happened is that, 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 that attempt at Reformation led to really a, the Protestant revolt. Because they didn't just reform, they revolted against and away from Rome. By the way, there were people just like you and me there at the time. You've got to appreciate that. Luther didn't discover justification by faith alone. It was being preached in his day already. But he's in the religious system, and he brought it to light, and he had the ability to put it on the burner politically where everybody would see it. And so what happens is that that, 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 that revolt that starts there led to a half a millennium, 500 years now, of spiritual growth and fervor and enlightenment at the heart. And this is, to me, this is the most critical thing to, to, to think about the Protestant revolt. At the heart of, of, of what was going on there was, was a commitment to put God's word in the hands of people, of the common man. I have a title there called of Popes and Plowmen. And that's a, that's a famous quote. The reason the Reformation moved from the continent of, of uh, your, Germany and so forth, Martin Luther, he took your Bible, he took a textus receptus, that's, that's the received text. That means the Bible that the common people, not the religious system, the common man had been using. You know there are readings in your Bible, in the King James Bible, in the book of Mark, that you can go back to the 6th century that's a long time ago. And find in vernacular languages in northern Europe almost exactly. You, you can read them in that language and in, in, in that dialect, and then you read the verses in Mark, and you say, I can see where that translation in Mark came from there. Down through the ages, people like you and me have been using the text you have in your Bible. Luther took that, not the, not the Catholic text. Now, you guys know this. But if you take a modern version of the Bible, you take a New American Standard, for example, which all the conservatives say is the best. You take the, the, new, the English Standard Version, which is the new one. And you take them and you compare those readings with a King James Bible. And you compare them with a Roman Catholic Bible. You know who they agree with? The Catholic Bible. Because they come off of that Vatican line of manuscripts that rejects the Bible that, that the Protestant reformers put into the, back into the hands of people. Now, when they put it into their hands, they, what, they, what they did, Luther took that Bible, translated it into German, which is his native tongue, and out of that German translation, it was translated into somewhere between 30 and 40 different vernacular languages. What are they doing? They want to put the Bible in the language of the common man so he can read the Bible because there's no way to be freed from the shackles of religious tyranny as successfully as if you have your you have a Bible to read for yourself, understand for yourself, and believe for yourself. And the genius of the Reformation was that they did that. The reason the Reformation moved from the continent to England was because the issue of Bible translating moved that way. And when Tyndale, who was the first one that put the Bible into the English language, the, the whole Bible, when uh, uh, the great, uh, about three-fourths of your King James Bible is really t go, has its roots in Tyndale. <laughs> it's amazing. It started with Tyndale, and there's, there, there, there's a bunch of... It took 100 years to get it to from the beginning to the conclusion with the King James Bible, where there's this purification and amplification and development of it, and they finally, we finally got it right. Tyndale was persecuted. King Henry persecuted him. The Catholics persecuted him. They finally, they finally killed him. Wycliffe, a couple of centuries before, had translated the New Testament into, in, into what would be Old English, but the English of his day. Have you ever read Chaucer when you're in high school? Some of you guys are too young to have an education like that. But <laughs> in, the, in the era of Chaucer, uh, Wycliffe and Chaucer 
were, were, were credited with developing the English language. And when you read the Canterbury Tales in Chaucer, they would put by it Wycliffe's Bible and study the two. That's the kind of language it was in. And, you know, when, when I was in high school, we, we read that, and they said, that's what English looked to, used to look like. And that's how the language developed. Well, when, when Wycliffe died, some years later, the Catholics loved him so much that they dug up his bones and burned them and then scattered them on the river. Why? Because they translated the Bible in the language of the people. They did the same thing to Tyndale. But Tyndale had gotten his Bible done. And a lot of wonderful things, stories about it and things. But he's the one that said, or his creditor was saying, that somebody asked him about the Pope. He said, I, I'm going to see the day, and this is a loose, my quote, my, my paraphrase. I'm going to see the day when the boy that walks behind the plow, the plowman, knows more about the Bible than the Pope. In other words, I'm going to put a Bible in his hand that he can read. And when he begins to read it, you know what happens when you start reading the Bible? You'll start figuring out how to study the Bible. Somewhere along the line, you're going to read long enough till you find a verse that says, study. What a concept. That's what I wanted to do. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to do it to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Whoa, I found my answer. Why? Because I'm reading the Bible. I'm studying the Bible. I'm trying to figure out how to study it. I'm going to let it teach me because I don't trust those dudes up there in the ivory religious tower. And that was the idea. Put it in there. And the genius of the Protestant movement was that it went back to where the church had been before of putting the Bible into the hands of the common people so you've got a Bible. That movement that put the Bible into the hands of the English-speaking world took your Bible into the languages of all the worlds. That King James Bible has been translated into over 1,500 different languages. There are whole missionary organizations. I have friends who spent, spent 20 and 30 years of their lives going off into the jungles in Bolivia in little mountain villages that didn't have a written language and go in there and learn the language, live, with, live, live in, 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 in hovels for years and learn the language and write a language down so that they could be able to translate God's Word into that language this little language that didn't have but about 1,500 words in it had no written language. It's been people that, what was the motive behind that? To get God's Word into their language. Why? Because that's where the life, everlasting life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so the whole motivation behind all of that, the thing that was the genius at the heart of the Protestant revolt, was to putting God's word into the hands and in, thus into the languages of the common man. We gather here tonight in this meeting, this week, in that great tradition of that heritage. A lot's been done. A lot of truth has been recovered. There's a lot that needs to be done, still to be done. It's your time and it's my time you know, the, the heading, the conference is holding forth the word of life, and then the subheading is in times like these or for a time like this. And we live in an era when this whole issue of the Bible being in the, com the language in the hands of the common people is on the table. The great genius of putting the word of God in the hands of the people is what, what produced Western civilization. Our president was in Poland a few weeks ago, and he gave what people said was a Reagan-esque speech. Now, when you, I heard him give it, I thought, well, he didn't write that. I've read things that he wrote. <laughs> but he got some good writers, and he read it real well. And he went to Poland, and he, and he praised them for their courage. Imagine, here's a nation that, that quit being a nation who has become a nation again. And he talked about the fight to recover and maintain Western civilization. Now, that's a poo-poo today in America. When you hear people talk about they, they hate America and that kind of thing, it's, it's Western civilization that they're really talking about. 
And Western civilization is really the, the, the spiritual and economic and social and cultural witness to the freedom that the Word of God and the gospel of grace brings to people. No other religious concept is built on freedom. We have a wonderful song in the book that says, Glorious Freedom. <laughs> we love to sing that. Why? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And that freedom, we're free from sin, we're free from the bondage of sin, we're free from the, a performance-based system to gain God's blessing. We have a glorious freedom in Christ, a freedom not to just go do what we want to do. We're doing that to start with, and that got us in trouble. But a freedom to take the life of God and have that life live in us and through us for His glory and for our good. And that freedom, when it come, becomes the heart of people, produces a social and cultural and economic impact. And that's where, listen, Western civilization didn't come where it is by, by building itself on the back of Plato and Socrates and Pluto, Pluto. <laughs> Pla <laughs> that's who I think of him as Pluto. <laughs> and the Greek philosophers. The Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, they stole, listen to me, they plagiarized their ideas out of your Old Testament. You can take the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a book of, of, of the wisest man that ever lived, humanly speaking, talking about his experience in the world when he, when he left God's, God's truth and went to do it himself. And you can find Aristotle's golden mean, you can find all of the things that made the philosophers of the Greek world. Listen, they had that Bible sitting on the table in front of them, and if they had any wisdom in their head, what would they have done? Been familiar with it. And they literally plagiarized it. They don't give, the, they don't give it any credit because they didn't believe it and didn't think it was good. They just took the, the, the ideas out of it and made a name for themselves. Have you heard of anybody like that? See, things haven't changed really through history. And so when you come down to it, it's really the, the Word of God that's the issue and the things that have made our culture what it is. But as you look around you today, it's a sobering thing to see that there's, there's been a tremendous sea change. Seems like the church and Christians are the last people to notice it. We, used to, we usually either navel-gazing or looking in the past. But it's even beginning to dawn on people today in the church that the world about us, you know, back a few years ago they had the uh, moral majority and we we're going to do the culture wars. Listen, the cultural wars have been lost. People say, well, don't say that, brother. It's the truth. Somebody needs to wake up. The cultural wars are over. They, they won. We lost. But that doesn't mean you need to give up your hope. You know what that means? That means that the world that my grandchildren are going to live in is not going to be the same world that their granddad and their great-grandparents lived in. Their world is going to be much more like the world the Apostle Paul lived in than the world that any of us were raised in. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed it or not, but the Apostle Paul and his ministry, people talk about the 1800s being the great missionary era. They don't even hold a candle to the first 300 years of the church that came from the hands of the Apostle Paul. So it isn't necessarily that it's... Listen, it might affect somebody's bank account and it might affect some social condition you live in, but as far as an opportunity for the gospel and an opportunity to hold forth the word of life, you ain't seen nothing yet like the darkness that's going to come that's going to let little lights like us shine brightly. Makes you uncomfortable when you, when you realize that. You say, well, wow, you know, I like affluence. I like life of ease. I like things to be nice and wonderful and blah, blah, blah and all. I do too. I mean, look at me. I'm... I eat well. And if you knows my wife, you know why I look like I look.
But the fact is, we don't get to choose. We live where we are. And because of that, you need to understand that as things change and have changed, culturally, politically, they're, they're changing economically, socially. The key is still going to be putting God's Word in the hands of God's people. Taking that book, putting that book into the hearts of people. If the issue, if God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, then the issue is to take that book and put it in some saved people, get them saved, and then teach them. When I moved to Chicago in 1979, from the hills of Alabama. We got in, were involved in the ministry of North Shore Church down at Wilson Avenue and Sheridan Road in, in uptown in Chicago. Tough neighborhood. Not, not tough neighborhood. It's the, it's the north side of Chicago that's comparable to the bad neighborhoods in the south side. It's a tough area. And I, we, I, we'd have meetings in the morning and people would come all the neighborhood people wouldn't come at night. Too dangerous to walk the streets. Just the commuters. We'd come park in a secure bank parking lot across the street and go as a group across over here and go into the building, have meetings, and go back. And we did that for maybe six months, and I thought, you know, I don't have any idea how to minister in a town. I came from a town. I spent eight years building a church in a town that was in a county of 35,000 people in the whole county. The county next to it had 9,000. The county the other way had 11,000. It was not a densely populated area, okay? You move to Chicago, the population density is 30,000 people per square mile. Now, that's a lot of people jammed up together. I said, I don't have any idea what to do. I went down one time. I was passing tracks. I go and passing out tracks. And I went down the corner of Montrose and Broadway. You Chicago people know where that's at. And... I'm passing out tracks, and nobody's doing much, you know. Cop drives up. He kind of said, what are you doing? I said, I'm letting people have these. Here, you can have one. <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, son, sit down here in the car. I said, hey, this is America, land of the free, home of the brave. I, I got, he said, yeah, sit down here a minute. <laughs> and I sat down in the car with him, and, he, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, he's going to... I had had a cop one time try to knock me off the top of a car. I was preaching on the street and stand on, had a rack on top of the car and had a cop. So I was ready to, I was ready to fight for my right to be on the street corner. That wasn't the deal. He says, does anybody come up and talk to you? I said, well, no, you know, people don't talk to you when you're preaching on the street. <laughs> and I see, he says, I said, yeah, that, that, that kid sitting over there on that bench, he, he's come over a couple of times and asked me, what do you want? I said, I can give him track. He says, you see that lady standing over there in the corner? This big, big, tall gal standing over in the corner across the way bus stop. I said, what do you think she's doing? I said, waiting on the bus. <laughs> he said, how long has she been there? I said, well, she's been there as long as I've been here. I said, well, have any buses gone by? I said, well, yeah, a few. Must not have been the right ones. He said, she's not waiting on a bus. I said, oh, what's she doing? And he looked at me. He said, son, where are you from? <laughs> And I, I thought, after that, I thought, you know, I don't know anything about ministering in a big city like this. So I went down to Moody Bible Institute. They had an evening class on urban evangelism with a guy from Boston who knew how to do this stuff. So I, Chuck Mikovich and I went down and took, took the class. Third week of the class, I told, him, told Chuck, I said, I ain't going back. That guy didn't know as much about this as I do. It's all just too much talk. And I started thinking about that. And one day... It, we had my son, Rick, my, my son, David, my son, Jody, they're here. They were, in, they, they were in the Sunday school class, and they were the only suburbanites in it. Everybody else were pretty tough neighborhood kids. And Roy Faber was our Sunday school teacher. And Brother Roy was in over his head, drowned But, you know, he loved those boys. And I think those kids knew he loved them. We had a guy come in. He says, oh, you know, you can't teach these kids anything. You know, we need to do this. this. And I thought, wait a minute. There's a man that's probably the only man these guys have in their life that puts his hand on their shoulders and says, I love you. You'll be back here next week. We're going to tell you more about God's love. And I thought, you know, I think these guys are nuts. So I threw all that stuff out. 
And it dawned on me, I said, you know, I know what the ministry is. God's desire is to have all men saved and come to knowledge of the truth. And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to look out here and get some people saved and then teach. We need to do the same thing here we were doing down in Alabama that we're doing out over yonder. We just need to do it in a different context and learn to talk the language of the street here and do that. And that was one of the most helpful things I ever learned about ministering in different places. Because when you came from Alabama to Chicago, it was as much cultural shock for my family as it was if we'd have gone to Timbuktu in Swahili land. Completely different culture. Same ministry issue. Because the issue is to take that book, because that's where the life is. It isn't a bunch of techniques and, and, and ideas and things that are the... Listen, you learn to speak the language of the people, whatever it is, so they hear what you're saying, but what you're saying needs to be that book. You follow that? That's the key, because that book is the key to the ministry. And that book is the key to your hope. Because even if the cultural wars are lost and, and the culture is changing and the sea changes is already there, we haven't lost our hope. Our hope is where? In nothing less than Jesus' righteousness. Our hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's a passage here that just really... As we would say, it fries my bacon. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 7. You folks that are Shorewood people, I talked to you about this last week. So you, it's going to be a little review for some of you. First Corinthians 7, verse number 26, Paul says, Now Paul's talking about a whole bunch of things here about marriage and divorce and remarriage and problems in you and so forth. But I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in the, so much in the, in the issue he's talking about. I want you to look at how he talks about addressing it. Verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. Paul said, there's some things that you need to do in light of the present distress. Now, one of the things he says there, and it's why people get mad at this passage, uh, I say that it is good for a man so to be, that is, to be unmarried. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not a, to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, that is not sin. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, t the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none. Now, if you quit reading right there, you're going to go bonkers. Notice the verse doesn't end there. He doesn't just say, that it remaineth as though, uh, that both they that have wives be as though they have none. He doesn't stop. He keeps going because the issue here isn't marriage. The issue is how you're dealing with it. Not just marriage, but a bunch of things. They that weep as though they wept not. They that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. You see all those ands in there? There's marriage, there's weeping, there's rejoicing, there's buying, there's possessing. There are all these different things in life, and what are you supposed to do? For, verse 31, and they that, that use the world, not as abusing it. For, here's why you're going to do these things. The fashion of the world does what? Passes away. Listen, in your life with the world, whether it's marriage, whether it's weeping, whether it's rejoicing, whether it's possessing things, whether it's buying things, whatever it is you're dealing with in life, it's going to pass away. So when you hold on to it, how should you hold on to it? You shouldn't hold on to it like it's life or death and you never can let it go. You need to hold it loosely. Now, it didn't say throw it away. He's not saying go get divorced if you're married. And it's not saying if you're not married, you never can get married. He's saying, listen, whatever your status in life, if you're weeping, you're rejoicing, you're, you're buying your possession, you're using your marriage. He said, hold the things of this world loosely because the fashion of this world passes away. It isn't going to last forever. Verse 32, but I would have you without carefulness. I love that. <laughs> I don't want you all worried and full of care and anxiety. You remember Philippians 4.4 4 there, don't you? 
Why does he want you that way? Because, brother, if you hang on to the things of this world, you know what you're going to have? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression. Excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Woo! Gloom, despair. You guys act like you never saw that, heard, saw that show. <laughs> you don't act like you're more righteous than I am. You sit there like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're so, you're so culturally obtuse that it's not worth to explain it to you. Now go back, to, go back and look at what he's saying. Verse 26, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. Now the way that verse is generally taken is they say, well, there's something going on right now that is so bad that you don't need to get married and you don't need to weep and you don't need to rejoice. But you know, I got thinking about that, the present distress... They say, well, that's the persecution under Nero. But the Corinthians weren't experiencing that at that time. So I got to thinking about it. What's he talking about? The present distress. You know what? Do, you, can you, do we need to look at it or can I just tell you? 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. You remember what that verse says? Then in the latter times, in the last days, wonderful times are going to come. Better times are coming. Look over there, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a scary passage. 2 Timothy 3, in Paul's day, he says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, I know, know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Troublous, difficult, perils ahead. Verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax, not better and better, worser and worser. I don't know what a preteristic pre, uh, uh, post millennialist would do with that verse. You know, that thing's everything's getting better and better in every way till Jesus is going, it's going to be somewhat attractive down here. He'll come back down here. Paul says it begins in my day, and as far as you can, not just right this minute, but as far as you can see out there. And when you get to the end of the dispensation of grace, it's going to be worse than it is now. When he talks about the present distress, he's talking about that's the condition of this present evil age. And he says about that present distress in verse number 29, the time is short. Now, when he says time, he's not talking about it's 8.15 and now we only got 40 minutes before it's over with. You better hurry, Brother Rick. He's not talking about the time of the day. He's talking about... Look with me back at Philipp at Romans chapter 8. He's talking about the, the dispensation, the era that we live in. He's talking about the dispensation of grace. Now, I know a dispensation is not a time period, but it covers one. And he's talking about the time is short. When something is short, it means it's not going to go on forever. You live in an in a era, in an age, in a dispensation that isn't going to last forever. It has a limit to its extent. You understand the dispensation of grace isn't going to continue forever. God isn't going to continue to build the church, the body of Christ, forever. There's, a, there's going to come a point where the last person gets in and the dispensation of grace is over. The Lord Himself descends from heaven with a shout and the dispensation of silence is over and the prophetic program starts, the wrath program starts again. It's short. It has an end. It's not limitless. We live, in a, we, we live in a time, in a dispensation, that has a limit to its extent. Look at Romans chapter 8. When he talks about this, uh, this present distress, this limited age. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. I reckon, for I reckon that the sufferings of this Notice, present time. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about the dispensation of grace. What's the characteristic of the dispensation of grace? 
the sufferings of this present time. The present time is an age of suffering, not glory. He said, I'm, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So right now, we're in this time of suffering, the characteristic of the present time, this present evil world. Paul said, redeeming the times because the days are evil. They're not, he's not saying, look, things are going to get better and better. He's saying that the time's getting worser and worser. So when he's talking about that present distress, he's not talking about, well, it's a little persecution. It's going to get better over there. And you do this here and you do that over there. Paul, I mean, that's crazy anyway. Paul wouldn't tell you it's okay to do one thing here and that'll save your life and do, do that over here and it'll destroy your life. That he sees that present distress going all the way through this time of suffering. If you look, look at verse 19. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation. You see that word expectation? When you see the word hope in your, in your Bible and Paul's epistles, the word hope is, is the, the concept of hope. When you see hope, think expectation. I have this confident expectation. And every time you see the word hope in Paul's epistles, it's a reference to the Lord's coming. It's a reference to that glory which shall be revealed in us. Christ in you, the hope, the expectation of glory. And when you see that hope in, in your Bible, it is that expectation. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be, uh, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. See, the expectation, the hope, is to be delivered from a bondage of corruption into glory. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Now, when you're groaning... What are you doing? You're yearning. You're yearning for deliverance from this bondage of corruption. So look at what he says. Groaning within ourselves. Not only that, verse 23, not only that, they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groaning within ourselves, waiting. For what? For the adoption. What's that? The redemption of our bodies. You know when the adoption takes place? You've been predestinated. Rodney went over this. Predestinated to the adoption of children. You've been, you've, as a believer, you've had your destiny prefixed to that adoption which is the redemption of your body. That's the resurrection when you get your glorified body at the event we call the rapture. Where you are then placed into the glory, into the sharing of the glory, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then we shall we appear with Him in glory. He'll be manifested as the only potentate, <laughs> King of kings and Lord, and you're going to be sharing in that glory. For we are saved by hope. You see, we're saved from the groanings. By that expectation that we have of His coming and the glory we'll share with Him in it. Now, that's Paul's thinking process. Paul doesn't say, well, you know, this stuff might happen in 10 years or maybe 500 years. If he was to say, you know, we're waiting, but don't worry about it. The Lord isn't going to come for 10 years or maybe 500. He's saying, this thing, the time is short. And you need to be ready because the thing that's going to happen is we're going to be delivered. What you're waiting for is not some long extended stuff. We're waiting for the deliverance. And in Paul's mind, that's right, right there. Look at chapter 13. 
Romans 13. Romans chapter 13, verse number 11. The, and that, knowing the time, and we're talking about this present time. What is that? This present distress? The time is short. What is the time? And that knowing the time. Well, what is the time? It's that time of the suffering. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, the glory that's to come, nearer than when we believed. In Paul's thinking, his mindset is to always think of the Lord's coming and our being glorified with Him as what? Near. His mindset isn't, it's far away. Now somebody says, well, Paul never uses the word imminent. And he doesn't. Eminent, eminence, that's a theological term. Okay? You can refute the theological definition of eminent because what I've discovered is that everybody that talks about eminence has a different definition. You can refute that of the theological definition, but you can't change the sound doctrine that it's designed to express. And that is that in Paul's mind, the Lord could come at any moment. We say he could come at any moment, perhaps today. Now that's our way of expressing that's our human expression of something, of a hope, an expectation that God has placed into our heart. Look at Romans chapter 15. Because this is not just doctrinal words talked about. This is an expectation that God himself has placed into the heart of every believer. Romans 15 verse 13. Now the God of hope, I love that title. The God of expectation. Listen, God has a plan for His creation. He has a plan for the body of Christ. And He is excited about that plan. Those verses are talking about the zeal of the Lord of hosts have eaten me up. Talking about the Lord. He's excited about what, 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 what Jehovah's plan is. That's talking about Israel's plan. He's excited about what He's going to do with the body of Christ. He's the God of hope. i got a plan out here. God has some things that he's expecting to come. Confident expectation of the future. But look what he does. Fill you. The God that has this expectation is going to fill you. He's going to put inside of you in a way that it controls you with all joy and peace in believing. You know where joy and peace comes from? It comes from Believing God's Word. Why is he going to do that? That you may abound in hope. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. You see, the God of hope takes that hope, that plan. He's got this plan for the future. What is it? That you would have this redemption of your body. That there would be this glory that he's going to reveal in us in the ages to come. And that's the focus of his expectation. The God of hope, he doesn't put into your heart the hope. and the, What expectation does he put? Well, he expectation, the hope of a new job. Not what he fills you with. The hope that I get a new house or a new mortgage rate. You know, the, we have all these things that we, we focus on. That's not, what, that's not what the hope, what the expectation is about. The hope isn't about getting a car or a spouse or whatever. The hope isn't just to get out of here so the trials don't bother me anymore either. The hope is that hope of glory. That hope 
is that earnest expectation of having the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory be manifest in us. And when it says he fills you with all joy and peace in believing, the God of hope plants in you an expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his eternal glory, and that we express that. And Paul's thinking expresses it by saying, it could be today. It might be in the next 10 minutes. When I was young, they used to say, you plan like he won't come for 10 years, you live like he might come in 10 minutes. And that's the, that's the expression. And when you think like that, you're thinking in the mindset of Paul. When you come along and say, nah, he's, he can't come now, can't be for 7 more years, can't be for 40 more years. When you do that, you, that, that's not Paul's mindset. That's not thinking like Paul thought. You know, that thinking, that's thinking like Israel. God sent Israel into Babylonian captivity. He told Ezekiel, he said, you go down there, he told Jeremiah, you go down and tell them, you're going to go to Babylon, you're going to be there 70 years. Buy a house, get a job, put down roots, you ain't coming back. It'll be your kids' kids that come back, you're going to be there 70 years. Plan on it. Don't have any hope of coming back soon. I'll bring you back one day, but it ain't going to be any time soon. Now, that's, that's Israel's thinking. That's not Paul's thinking. When you think like Paul thought, you think, boy, this thing could happen right now. And listen, you need to refuse to be robbed of the joy and peace of believing that it could happen today. Come with me. I got about 15 passages here, and I got 15, less than 15 minutes, so I'm not going to get through all of them. Come over to chapter 16. Romans 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Now, you know what that is? That's Genesis 3, 15. When he, and I love it, he bruises Satan under you. We're up here. He's down here. Christ comes back and destroys the satanic program, puts him in the bottomless pit. When does he expect that to happen? Shortly. He's not saying, I'm expecting this to happen. We at you under 500 years from now. He says, you know what? The time's short. This dispensation of grace is going to be over with, and God's going to deal with that rascal soon. You see, in Paul's mind, come with me to Philippians chapter 1. You in Corinthians, you, you, just stop at 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 7. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for what? See, it didn't say waiting for the undertaker. Didn't say waiting for the antichrist. Didn't say waiting for the tribulation. What is your expectation? Come with me to Philippians chapter 1. Watch Paul's personal explanation of his expectation. Philippians chapter number 1. Philippians 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Wow, that's a, that's a great verse. I've been, I've been working on that verse for 50 years. For to me, to live is Christ. He gave his life for me at Calvary, so he could give his life to me when I trusted him, so he could live his life through me day by day as I walk by faith in an intelligent understanding of, 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 of his word. So life becomes him. Life is to treasure him above everything else, to cherish him. And when people see you cherish him, his thinking, his desires, his will above all of yours or theirs, he's, man he's glorified in your body. He's manifest in your body. And that's God's purpose today in the body of Christ is to put his son on display in flesh and blood reality of his life. For to me to live is Christ, and to die, it's gain. Why is it gain? Well, keep reading. For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose, I will not. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm to a rock and a hard place. 
I don't know what to choose. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. To leave and to go be with Him is better than anything this world can offer me. Now your wife bats her eyes at you and says, Now, Sugar, are you sure about that? In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, Hold that relationship loosely because it ain't going to be forever. Marriage is till death do us what? It's temporary. It's wonderful. Two years, I'll have been married 50 years. How my wife has done it, I don't know. We've been married so long, neither one of us can remember when we weren't married. The only thing she remembers about our pre before we got married is her chasing me. I chased her till she caught me. But as wonderful as it is, it isn't forever. To depart and be with Christ is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. She said, I don't know what to choose. My personal desire is to depart and be with Christ. That's, that's far better. That's where my personal desire is. And that's not escapism. See, people say, all you want to do is just escape your pre-. That's not escapism. That's a yearning for something better. Than what can be found in this world. It's not I'm trying to escape my problems. It's in the midst of this present suffering. There's something so much more wonderful. And I yearn. For that glory which shall be revealed in us. That's where my heart is. Now if you come over to chapter 3. And by the way, when people say, well, when you just believe, you know, you're trying to get out of your problems and it's just escapism. And that it breeds irresponsibility. Do you know anybody who was more a responsible servant of the Lord and a productive than Paul was? Had nothing to do with avoiding responsibility. This guy was willing to have Christ magnified in his body, whether by life or by death. And it wasn't at the expense of responsibility here. It's just that there's an expectation. The sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory and God put in my heart a yearning for Him. Chapter 3, Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is where? It's in heaven. From whence we look for our Savior. Heaven is our realm, not this world. They sing that old song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Now, that's a lot of poetic license in there, but the sentiment's right. Our conversations in heaven, everything about our life is there. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We're seated with Him in heavenly places. Everything about us is there. That's our realm, not here. We're strangers down here. We're foreigners down here. We're ambassadors, representatives in a foreign country. <laughs> this isn't our home. This isn't where we need to get locked down. We belong to heaven. We're like a bunch of expats here. Our future is in heaven, not here. Now, that's where we look for our Savior. That's where he's coming from. You know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting for my Savior from heaven. I'm not waiting for the Antichrist, the Undertaker. I'm waiting for the Upper Taker to take me there. The hope isn't here. The future's not here. The future's there. And I'm ready to get on with it. And until I, until I do, I'm waiting. I'm working while I'm waiting because there's things to do. But my, my work is in light of the hope... And the joy and the peace that hope gives me, gives me the comfort to do the work and endure the nasty now and now. 
when you're actively waiting for our Savior, you see there's that... I'm trying to get you to see in these verses, there's this attitude that Paul has of this continuing daily expectation. Now, if you say, well, but he can't come for 50 more years or seven more years, you take away that daily expectation, that daily hope, the comfort, the peace and the joy, the calmness. And the thrill that that's designed to put in your heart. And you lose it. Come with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints and the hope, the expectation which is laid up for you where? In heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? You know what you heard when you heard the gospel? That there is an expectation of glory in the heavens. Look down at verse 23. Heaven's where we belong. That's where our, our life, our future, our inheritance is. Verse 23, if you continue in the faith... Grounded and settled. Now watch. And be not moved away from what? The hope, the expectation of the gospel that you heard when you heard the gospel and you had this hope about this treasure laid up for you in heaven. Don't let somebody come along and steal, remove you from that expectation of glory that could be yours at any moment. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The wealth, the riches of the glory of this mystery is that it could be yours in possession fully any moment. Christ in you, the hope, the expectation of the glory that shall be revealed in us. I read those things and I say, boy, if you're going to think like Paul thinks, you've got to think this thing could happen any moment. Don't let somebody move you away. Don't let somebody rob you. We're to be living in that expectation. We're to be expecting the glory. Don't let somebody come along and say, well, it's not today. That's removing you from the hope. Of glory. If you come over to 1 Thessalonians 4, you know this passage. I don't have to read it to you. But the details of it. Verse 15, he says, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the Lord, in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Pooh. When it says, so shall we ever be with the Lord, all the details of our exodus are there. The shout, dispensation of silence is over. We're back in the heavens ago. The shout, resurrection, up you go. You've got an angelic escort to take you up there. And you're going to be manifest with. And you're going to be the reunion with the saints. The head and the body put together. I mean, it's just wonderful stuff you read about. The more you read about that, you just get, you can't help but go, woohoo! And be filled with glory. Filled with joy and peace. I don't care what's happening around you. That can fill you with some, that's what it does. They, they, they've lost loved ones, and it says, Listen, we saw, but not as others which have no hope, because these words comfort you. This truth puts some comfort, some fortitude in your inner man. They fill you with joy and peace in believing them. Because there, that's what the God of hope, that's the expectation our God and Savior has. That's what He's looking forward to. I think maybe I'll agree with Him. Ever to be with the Lord. I love that. When he says to be with the Lord, he's not talking about being in the same room with him. 
It's not talking about physical proximity because you would never be able to be with him. There's too many of us. There's millions of members of the body of Christ. How would you, I mean, people say, well, we're all going to be on the earth with him. That's not what it's talking about. Are you for me? Are you with me or against me? That's what that's talking about. We're going to be with the Lord. We're going to be working together with him in perfect, complete, total harmony. I knew a guy many years ago at the rescue mission in Mobile. He said for him, the greatest thing about going to be with the Lord was he'd never disappoint the Lord again. And I, you know, doctrinally, that's not really a great statement, but humanly speaking. Because the more you live day by day, the more you realize how, how you come short. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. As soon as you think you're doing pretty good, the old preacher used to say, the, the closer you get to the light, the better you see the dirt. The closer you are to who you really are in Christ, the more you see it's not I, it's Christ. Amen. And as soon as you start thinking it's you, then you forgot it's not you, it's Christ. But you know, the, the idea of going to be with the Lord, I'm never going to not be in total harmony. <laughs> I'm not going to have to worry about the dirt under my fingernails anymore because I've got the adoption. I've got the glorified body. I'm put in that position of being manifest to be the son, the adult in the family. I said, wow. Wherefore, comfort one another. That's what's going to put some comfort and some, some, some starch in your shorts. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus 2.13. Looking. <laughs> I can't help but like that. Here's what grace teaches you. Verse 12. For the great, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. Here's what grace teaches you. Denying and dunking godless and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking. Grace teaches me to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God wants you to know the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants you to see the wealth that's yours coming out there. And we're to be looking. When you're looking, you're expecting it to happen. Well, I got married. I moved to Florida to go to school. And I, we, we were engaged. We were going to get married. So while I was there, I, 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 we had the date. We knew it was happening. And I knew I was going to bring Cynthia there to work, live with us in, with me in Florida after we got married. And start the next school year. So I rented a house, a little four-bedroom house. Four room house, I'm sorry, and a uh, little lady that had, had it, you know, she landlord, and I rented the house. fifty five dollars a month was the rent, and uh, I rented the house. I had a rollaway bed and a a chair, stuffed chair. That's all the furniture I had. I had a plate and a cup and a set of silverware. It's only me. I'd eat, wash the plate. Put it in the sink. It's all I needed. I didn't need more. And one day, I went to school, and I worked, but I worked at night. And worked eleven seven shift at a hospital. I was a bed. I was a bed. I was a orderly in a hospital, bedpan slinger. And so I'd come home, and I would catch a little sleep before I had to go to school, and. One, one day I, I'd gone to bed. Now, I would come home 7 o'clock in the morning, and I would stop at what you call White Castle. It's got a crystal down there, but it's a White Castle. You get sliders. And I'd get six sliders, and I'd eat them on the way home, and that was my meal for the day. 
I'd take them, crumble them up, put them in the bag. So I had a bunch of, and I'm a guy, I'd have a bunch of bags. Of, and I, wake up one, I woke up one morning, and there was my daddy standing there looking at me. I didn't know he was coming. That was a bad, I looked up, oh, hi, Pop. He said, hello, Rick. Bye. I couldn't get out of the bed. My pants on out the door fast enough to catch him. He darted in the car and left. He didn't really like what he saw. Two weeks later, my dad, my uncle, my aunt, my mother, and my future wife showed up with a trailer full of furniture. We already had the furniture stored. In mo- they put sheets on the bed. <laughs> they set up a bed, took my rollaway bed away. You got, I said, Ms. the landlord, he said, I was always worried about it. it didn't have, I, I had a chair to sit and study in, and I had a bed to sleep in. And I, I, well, I didn't need it. Now I got a table. I got an eight-place setting of plates and stuff. What am I going to do with all this stuff? I have to have company. <laughs> and, but I remember the horror of looking at my dad and not being prepared for his coming. I'd had an experience a few years before that when I worked at the rescue mission in Mobile. And I started working in the mission the summer between my 10th and 11th grade in high school. I worked through college. And after I got out of high school, got into college, I actually lived at the mission, had an apartment there and lived there. And my mom kept telling me, I'm going to come down and see your place. Well, if you know your mother's coming, what do you do? I kept it vacuumed. I kept it clean. I got up in the morning. I made the beds. I, I you know, I, I every, and a couple of weeks went by, and I said, Mom, I thought you were coming. Well, I'm coming. I'm coming. Just hadn't got around to it yet. <laughs> After about two months of that, I said, you know, Mom, I don't, I, before you come, you need to call because it's not going to be really convenient to have you come up. And I made up this story about how, you know, we don't have women up in that part of the mission and, and that stuff. And it was true, but I, my mom would, would have made a difference. So that she'd give me an alert because I, I was worn out keeping the place clean. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you do when you have an expectation. You got the slider packages in the corner when you don't have an expectation. But you clean the place up when you do. Looking. Living with that expectation of Christ's coming. That it could happen any time, folks. It could happen tonight. The heart's prayer that God puts in your heart is, even so come Lord Jesus. If it doesn't, you plan like he doesn't come for 10 years, but boy, you want him to come right now. Because that earnest, that yearning, our yearning is more for him than anything on this planet. And you see, the problem is we can't always say that. We get enmeshed. You go back to Romans 13 sometime and notice when he talks about don't wake out of sleep. How do you go to sleep? Read the rest of that chapter. You get enmeshed in the things of this world. And your Christian life just goes to sleep on you. One of the things that he's coming, it keeps you alert. It keeps you aware. It gives you that peace, that inner calm, that joy. And it lets you hold on to the world loosely. Even to the good things. Because they aren't what life really eternally is about. And you have to keep your priorities where they need to be. We're living in days that are predicted by the Apostle Paul. Perilous times. It's important to know how to live in in these kind of days. You You don't lose your hope. You don't lose your expectation. Your expectancy of his coming for you. You hold on to that. The fundamental question that you and I face. You listen to me. 
is whether we who are saved by grace, we say we have a Bible you can trust, a gospel you can believe, a study you can understand, a life you can live, a purpose you can fulfill. We who are saved by grace and understand those issues. The question is, the bottom line is, do you really have the confidence in that truth to defend that truth at any cost? Do you have enough respect for your Savior and concern for the lost to protect the doctrinal distinctives that we know and hold? Do you have the courage to preserve those fundamental Bible-believing, mid-acts, grace truths that we espouse? Because, friend, if we don't have strong local churches led by men of grounded and sound doctrine, men who have godly men with personal integrity and the doctrinal soundness, we're going to be weak and we aren't going to survive as a movement. And frankly, it's time to fish or cut bait about that. And it's going to cost. There's going to be a blowback. It doesn't matter. It's going to cost. You know that. When you stand for the truth, it costs. When you stand for the truth... There's blowback. And the question is, are you willing to, to stand? Because even when you do it feebly. So the question is, holding forth the word of, of life in a time like this. This is your time. And the future of the things we believe and hold dear in our fellowship are on the line. And the will, time will tell. If the Lord tarries, time proves character. I, want to, I just want to read you something that's the fruit of what we're doing so that you can understand the value of it. We have a young lady in our assembly in Chicago. She's just a teenager. When she was about 15 years old, they discovered she had cancer, bone cancer in her leg. They treated it to no real effect. Eventually, they had to amputate her leg to try to save her life. After that, the struggle with all of that, they discovered that, that it didn't really work because the cancer had spread. It's in her lungs and other parts of her body. She's tonight at Cleveland Clinic in, 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 in Cleveland, Ohio, being treated for advanced treatments and so forth. She's registered to go to college. She's graduated high school. She's registered to go to college and, and hopes to do that. But she's, she's just, it, it's just for, for those of us that know her, it's just the most tragic thing in the world because she's a, a ray of sunshine. She's never one time said to anybody, why did this happen to me? Here's her testimony. Someone asked her on Facebook, I'll never understand why bad things have to happen to Christians who love the Lord like you. Now, what do you say back to that? Unfortunately, it's happened to me because we live in a fallen world. Even though we believe in our Savior, doesn't mean we're kept from the evils in the world that we cause by our sin. The only reason I'm still the person I am today is because of the hope that I have in our Lord. He saved our soul. He saves our souls from this world not our bodies. Now that's from a teenage girl. That's what sound doctrine does. Don't tell me you can't teach children, young people, young adults truth that it makes a difference in their life. There's a girl who puts a lie to that. I'm grateful to be a part of a ministry that would produce that kind of ministry. But can I tell you that that's what's at stake, that kind of clarity. That's what the hope does. Because that little girl goes, lives with the hope that whatever it is here is just glory in the end.
and that everlasting consolation and good hope through grace establishes you in every good word and work. This is a time to not lose your hope. Don't worry about the politics. It's all phony anyway. Don't worry about the economy. It's all phony anyway. Don't worry about the social stuff. It's all phony anyway. Don't worry about all that stuff that everybody trying to make money off of you is trying to make you worry about. Stand in what's real. Where your real hope is. And make that your life. And let that be your life. And until He comes for us, be faithful waiting the old song said I'm waiting I'm watching and I'm working God help us to be those expectant Thessalonians by the way if you come in here tonight it's a big crowd of folks and there's probably no chance that this isn't true and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ personally I've said it many times. I would have sat in a room just like this and you would have thought I was a believer when I was on my way to hell. I never smoked a cigarette. I never drank, I never drank alcohol. I, I, when I was in the sixth grade, I, I tried to cuss some boys out. I, I was so bad at it. They shamed me so bad for not knowing how to cuss. I quit even trying to do that. I wasn't raised in a home that did that. I was raised in a fam Christian family. When I was in high school, I had a, some of my friends said, you've got the only daddy I know that doesn't cuss. And I used to think, oh, man, that's, that's why I can't cuss. I never had an example. <laughs> and went to church, did all, but I was lost on my way to hell. Because not doing a bunch of stuff or doing some stuff doesn't save you. What saves you is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ exclusively. There's never a time in my life I ever doubted that he was God who died on the cross for the sins of the world. And yet I was still lost because I never trusted him personally to be my Savior. And I discovered I was 15 years old. I discovered that I was lost. And I spent months and months trying to figure out what to do about it. Did everything they told me at my church, went over to my wife's my uncle was her pastor, over to my uncle's church, did everything over there. No help because I was trying to do something. I thought believing was doing. One night I was sitting at an, or at an organ bench practicing. I played for the youth choir in our church, the 830 service in the Sunday mornings. And I was playing a song, and I thought, that's that Baptist song. When you play music, you don't sing the you don't play the you, the words on it. You have music's in your head, and I, I I started reading the words, just as I am without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me, and Thou bidst me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And I thought that's just like him, dumb Baptist. God says He doesn't have one plea, then He makes two. <laughs> I say, yeah. I, I start arguing with the with the, with with the song, and then it dawned on me that's not what He's saying, you nitwit. Just as I am without any other plea, except that your blood was shed for me and that you bid me come because of the blood. And it, was, it, it didn't happen, but it was as though in my mind heaven opened up and the light shone in. And for the first time in my life, I understood that faith was not me doing anything except trusting what Christ already did for me. And when I put my dependence on him... He saved me just like that. And I can tell you the burden lifted away. And I was still in religion, but boy, I was saved in religion. I was so religious, I went down that evening to the, to the, to the youth director and told them what had happened. And they didn't, I couldn't talk my youth director and my pastor into believing I just got saved. Oh, you've been saved all along, Ricky. You just had an experience. That, I said, no, I was lost. No, 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 you weren't lost. We gave you that certificate to prove that, you know. <laughs> when I went to the, started working at the rescue mission, I'd never seen a drunk in my life. 
I can still remember the first drunk, like Rodney walking. Rodney's not drunk, but he walking up that aisle <laughs> like that, and the guy staggering up the, the driveway in the mission, and I didn't know what's wrong with him. I had no idea. And the guys would laugh at me and say, oh, easy money, oh, brother. But I watched drunkards and prostitutes, derelicts, people that had lost their lives and their families, men and women, trust the Lord Jesus Christ at the wreckage of life and see him do for them just what he did for me. Because it wasn't what we had done, it's what he did. And if you sit here tonight and you want to say, I'm too far away, I could never be saved. Or I'm so good I don't need to be saved. I can tell you they're both wrong. They're both lies. And you know it. And no matter what anybody thinks about your situation, no matter what you think about it, it's your faith resting exclusively in Christ alone. Trusting him to be the Savior that he died and rose again for you to be. Because that's why he died for your sins and was raised again, so he could be your Savior. And the moment you rely exclusively on him, God will save you. Take you out of your sin and yourself and put you in his son. You don't have to go anywhere. Listen, you don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to do anything. If you had to do that much, you'd never know if you did it right. Maybe you should have done it that way. In the quietness and privacy of your heart right now, you tell God you're going to trust his son exclusively, and he'll save you. That's what it is. It's a personal thing, and you need to take it personally. And I say that to a crowd of people. Most of you I know are saved, but I know there's some people here that aren't. And I tell you that that's the key to life. As we hold forth the word of life, let's hold forth that hope. And let's do it with that expectation of eternal glory that it's going to give for our Savior. Father, we thank you tonight for life in Christ Jesus, for the light of your word, and for the hope, that wonderful, blessed hope that we have in him. In Christ's name, amen.